taking many horses to colic surgery and and things like that during my vet school and and immediately afterwards um, doing a lot of this kind of stuff. But what I realized as a general practitioner, this is like the number one thing that people call on emergency for with their horse. And what I especially started to realize is how how much people didn't necessarily know about it. Um, and that was the most concerning part um, is that because it is such an emergency situation, a lot of people weren't super prepared to handle it. And, um, and that was the main reason why we had this discussion. It was right about a year ago is I had many clients coming to me and saying, I just really like, I don't know what I should do or even what I should look for. And I think that um, it's something that we as veterinarians probably should be a little bit more proactive on because it is something where time is a little bit more crucial. And um, so kind of this, pro this presentation, part of it is from the AEP, which is my governing body. Um, and but part of it is also stuff that I've added in because I feel like that clinically, especially out in the field, these are the important things that I need you guys to know so that when you call your veterinarian or you call me, you are prepared for what's going to go forward. Um, so <clears throat> we did this, basically, this runs the whole gamut. It runs everything from like true colic and true emergency to your horses that aren't eating well or the horses that are not thriving well. Um, and all of those things can be attributed to stuff going on with the gastrointestinal tract of the horse. Um, so we'll kind of click through these and, and start and see where we get. Um, the biggest well, thing about the horse is, is unfortunately, um, the design of the horse, which is actually really similar to a rabbit, um, is designed in a way that makes things go wrong and go wrong in a hurry. Um, many, many, many feet of intestines um, that are here. And, and um, the biggest, most notable part of our um, uh horse anatomy is this really lar large colon. And I don't know if you guys can't really, oop, I gotta go back. Um, that big pink, basically U that makes it around, the horse has a basically a four stage um, a large intestine that acts very similar to what the big stomach of a cow does, except it's in the back part of the horse versus the front part of the cow. And that is where most of the digestion happens is in the large colon. But it is also the place that produces the most gas and it is also freely movable. And that causes the biggest amount of issues that we have in horses is that there's a large part of this colon that can move around um, with a little bit of gas or a little bit of pressure one way or another. And so that's the old mantra, like don't let your horse roll. Well, that's, that's because this gastrointestinal tract, this colon can move fairly freely within the horse's um, belly. And when it moves, sometimes it gets stuck in the wrong places. Um, and so that's what makes the horse pretty distinctly um, susceptible to colic and an emergency colic situation. So I know horses and cows are so much different. Um, are you going to talk about the differences at all or? Um, I hadn't planned on it. That's basically, basically the biggest thing that horses and cattle do is they, they both obviously eat forage and, um, consequently the biggest evolutionary thing that, that happened in horses and cattle is they had to have something that dealt with with grass and how fibrous it is and how do we get nutrition from those um, parts of um, the plant. Well, the way they did it um, was to have a part in their body that actually can um, basically ferment or break down those um, uh, plant materials. Well, in 
cows, they do it in their fore stomach. So their rumen, um, which is at the very beginning. And there's little bacteria that basically break it down. And from that bacteria breakdown, they actually produce gas. So many people who've been around cattle will know that sometimes when gas is not dealt with appropriately, they get cattle that bloat, um, especially in feeder calves or show steers, those kind of things. When you're feeding them things that make bacteria produce a lot of gas. Well, in horses, that part of it is actually in the colon versus in one of the stomachs. So the large part of the um, colon, especially the right dorsal compartment, um, is where most of the gas production occurs, which in horses can be the problem. So that's why certain forages that actually produce more gas can cause to cause colic situations to happen. So that's the biggest anatomical difference between the two is just location. Cattle very rarely colic, um, and it's probably because their gas production sits at the very front and also cattle can burp. And so that's a unique thing. So they can actually get rid of their gas whereas horses can't, because can't, horses can't, uh, or at least shouldn't burp. Uh, when they do, something really bad is going on, so. Well, thank you very yeah, much so for that's that main sidetrack. I appreciate you uh, talking about the difference. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll keep cruising on. Like I said, part of this is an AEP presentation that they provide for us. Um, um, yeah, so basically colic is, is truly the number one um, killer or disease of horses. Um, I probably on a weekly basis probably get anywhere from 10 to 20 calls about a colic situation. And that's why it says here most are mild and resolve and probably horses colic more than we ever see, but they just never get severe enough um, for us to see any clinical symptoms. It may pass within five minutes. Um, probably, honestly, by the time most of us think, um, they've probably been colicking or acting a little off for a number of hours. <clears throat> Occasionally, you don't where it, it has happened really. I'm sorry, it's telling me my internet's unstable. Well, hopefully that. I do have a lot of people ask me what colic is. Well, colic is just, just a name for a symptom. Um, they talk about it in infants. And when infants cry, they say they're colicky. And that basically it's just abdominal pain. Um, it's not an actual an actual true disease, it is um, a symptom. So honestly, what it means is there is about 501 different ways that horses colic. Um, obviously, more some are more more frequent than others, but it is just a symptom. Okay. And uh, I went ahead and turned off Dr. Marsh's uh, video so that she could save it all for the presentation. Hopefully, that'll help your internet, Dr. Marsh. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, as far as <clears throat> this is the biggest, this is the biggest thing for owners that we that is important for us is um, recognizing colic. Um, Basically, these are the big symptoms starting from the easy things to the things that are obviously more severe. Um, the first is just basically not eating. Um, I get a ton of calls about this. My horse just didn't eat breakfast, it didn't eat dinner, starting to become more painful because a horse lays down because they're trying to reposition in hopes that the gas bubble moves. Um, obviously, this is where things can get a little bit uglier. Um, turning the head towards the flank, biting at the flank, looking. Um, this is pretty common. Pawing. Pawing is probably the number one thing that people can see from a distance um, out in the field because horses are standing there head towards the ground and pawing. Uh, kicking and biting at the belly. Uh, this happens fairly frequently. You have to be a little careful during like fly season because you know 
consequently, some of these horses are actually trying to get rid of flies. So watching a horse for a few minutes, just kind of getting an idea if they show you any other symptoms. Repeatedly rolling, obviously that's another one that is, is showing that we're, our pain sensitivity is definitely increasing. Um, Dog-like position, it is very abnormal for a horse to sit like a dog. That means something is very wrong. Usually that means that they are so uncomfortable, maybe weak to rise in the back end. So that is something if you guys see it, I would call your veterinarian fairly immediately. Um, and then posturing to urinate, stretching out, trying to urinate. Oftentimes if we have enough gas going on in the colon, it will actually push on the bladder. So those horses do feel like they need to urinate and are feeling super uncomfortable because of it. Okay. Dr. Marsh, uh, does that also come with a, a temperature ever? Occasionally. There's um, many horses when they get to me and they're colicking, if anything, they're usually the other direction. They're usually cooler than we would hope. Um, and that's because of probably that their vascular flow is being kind of rerouted to the intestinal tract or to the heart. Um, so oftentimes those horses are colder. Uh, occasionally you'll get an increase in temperature and oftentimes those horses with increased temperature actually are sand colicking. For whatever reason, um, sand colic tends to raise the temperature of the colon itself. So it's not like a true fever. It's actually warmth within the intestinal tract. So if I get one with a fever, I start being a a little bit more concerned about um, sand colic or some sort of um, intestinal inflammation, which we'll talk about a little later when we talk about colitis. So um, yeah, so that's kind of how we usually see it. Very few of them run a true fever. Um, usually colics happen too fast uh, for the body to actually mount an immune response, which is a fever. So that's the Thank difference. You. Thank you very much. It's yeah. interesting about the temperature difference. Yeah. We have a few um, questions about the symptoms, but I'm going to let you get through what you have yeah. Right here. Yeah, I'll finish these four. Um, the holding the head in unusual position, oftentimes horses that put their head down and stretch their nose out, some of them will actually um, phlegm their lips, um, kind of cock their head to a side and act like they're grinding their teeth. Um, especially in young horses, foals, yearlings, um, they don't know what pain feels like yet. And so oftentimes they will do things like walk around and throw their head around, chew, um, act a little strangely that one wouldn't necessarily think was colic to start with. Um, lack of bowel movements, that is a huge thing. I mean, I have a lot of great clients that really, especially horses, Horses that are in stall runs that start recognizing when their horses are not, um, especially in Arc of the Woods in Wyoming, where a lot of we get a lot of impaction colics, where horses are not drinking sufficiently and it's cold and they're not moving around. Lack of bowel movements is huge, um, so that is is pretty important. Um, gut sounds, a, a reduced or absent digestive sounds. This is something where every horse owner I really think should go out and buy themselves a cheap $30 stethoscope from Valley Vet and keep it in a very accessible place. And basically I tell people just get used to listening to your horse. So put your stethoscope on before you go and ride. And what you're listening for is that flank area behind the ribs on both sides. We actually split it up into quadrants, the top and the bottom of each side. And in, real, in reality, you should hear about two to three um, movements per minute. It, um, anything above that is overactive and then anything less than that is underactive. Um, don't listen after you've just worked your horse because in reality, it should be pretty darn quiet, um, at least for a little while. 
So um, that is something that I would tell everybody to do. And because you'll get, you'll start to get an idea of what normal sounds like. And then that way, when you do have a horse that's acting weird, you can listen to them and say, yeah, that, that sounds about like it always does, or no, that doesn't sound quite right. Um, so yeah, cheap, cheap Valley Vet stethoscope works just great. Well, thank um, you very much for the tip. I didn't even think about before exercise versus after exercise. That makes sense. It would be much quieter. So I just learned something. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we just had a comment from one of the participants. Um, she said that once her horse was colicking and he was laying on his side and his legs were moving as if he was galloping. She was just curious if you'd ever seen that. Yeah, absolutely. Horses very much want to, um, and, and, and after having children, I kind of noticed this to be the case. What they do when they don't understand what's going on with them is they actually try to do things that they think will make it go away. And um, so that's why you will, you'll get a lot of these horses doing very unusual actions because basically they're trying to find something that makes it feel better. And, um, and so, yeah, you'll get a lot of, you know, stretching, laying on their sides, kicking their back legs straight out. Um, yeah, so they, they do do some very strange things, especially young horses. And especially if they've never really had a painful incident, they tend to be almost a little bit more violent about what they do because they don't really understand pain yet. Um, your older horses, on the other hand, oftentimes are extremely stoic. They've had maybe a few little colic episodes or even some big ones. And by the, you know, they just usually will stand around and kind of tolerate things. And unfortunately, sometimes that's the worst part about older horses or stoic horses is oftentimes they don't give you enough signs to be able to notice that something's wrong. Well, and thank you for the note about uh, younger horses. I, I wouldn't have thought that the signs might be different. So that is very relevant. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, the final one on this is just inappropriate sweating, which I think a lot of people do recognize, um, especially sweating horses in cold weather. Um, because obviously your body doesn't necessarily need to sweat when you're cold. Um, sweating inappropriately is a pretty good indication that something is wrong with the horse. For even anything, not even just colic, any other diseases, pain, um, anything like that will bring on sweating. And so especially head and neck um, around the face, and in the flanks are a pretty good indication that it's just an indication of pain is what it is. So, yeah. Um, oh, there's a few more. These are like big things. Um, rapid breathing, flared nostrils. I think most people will recognize that. Um, once again, with the stethoscope, um, best place in the world to kind of get an idea. Um, we listen to the heart. Um, as far as to get pulse rate behind the left elbow. Um, basically where the elbow meets the chest and where um, their heart rate is, anything above 50 is considered elevated and um, especially good thing for you to figure out maybe before you even take your horse to the veterinarian is because it no matter what, by the time they reach my place, their heart rate's gonna be elevated because they just bumped along on a trailer. So if you listen to them before you even pull them out of the pasture or pull them out of their pen and get a good heart rate, by the time you get to me, you can actually tell me, hey, you know, sitting in her stall, she was 60 beats per minute. That tells me that even in a calm situation, and she was in a decent amount of pain. So learning, um, finally, this depression. Depression is, um, is, you know, super big. It, you know, they don't eat. They just seem uninterested. Um, oftentimes when we can get those horses that early, things go very well. So 
the biggest thing about colic is trying to intervene early. And so if you can pick it up when your horse is just not acting quite right, um, then you're ahead of the ball game. We had one uh, oh, quick okay. question about symptoms and then we won't, uh, but I just thought it was interesting. Uh, had you ever experienced different indication of symptoms of pain and colic in different breeds, like a mini versus a Clydesdale? Yeah. Yeah, actually, that is, is is a very valid point. It probably has to do with pain tolerance. Um, I think miniature horses um, and miniature horses are like the bane of a veterinarian's existence when colic comes because a lot of our diagnostics are very hard and because in general, they tend to be very, very, very stoic. And so many times those guys just lay around. Um, most common presentation that I have in a colicking mini is he's just been laying there for a couple hours and he has no interest in anything. They, by the time those guys are rolling and acting very painful, oftentimes they are almost at a point to where I, we can't do anything for them. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, a lot of your your um, uh, quarter horses in general tend to be a little bit, I think it has to do with how they are behaviorally anyways. Um, quarter horses tend to be a little bit more stoic. Um, stallions tend to be, stallions and mares, and especially young mares tend to be overzealously overreactive. And I think we know that just dealing with them on a training basis, usually they are a little bit more emotional and they will show us things quicker. Uh, your classic middle-aged gelding is going to be the horse that we don't pick up on as fast. And oftentimes their symptoms are a lot, um, a, a lot more deceptive. And so yes, it, it oftentimes very much correlates on their behavior as a breed or by sex or whatever, they, they do tend to correlate with that. Um, even in my herd, I have, I have the gamut. I have a quarter horse mare that the second she gets an air bubble, she's throwing herself to the ground like she's going to die. And then I have an older quarter horse gelding that has colicked once in his life and he ended up at CSU for seven days. So it's, you know, they, they definitely run the gamut um, as far as how symptomatic they are. Well, thank you for that. I wouldn't have thought about that. Uh, so appreciate if you have different types of horses that they might be presenting quite differently. So thank you. There, there's some fabulous questions coming in, but I'm gonna let you uh, continue with your presentation and uh, we'll drop them in as we go along. So I appreciate you allowing me to do that, Dr. Marsh. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think this slide is super important. Um, call your, um, it's one of the main things that I teach my staff when they first start working with me um, is kind of a triage of colic and, you know, recognizing calling your veterinarian, having them kind of work through the symptoms with you will help you decide how, where your horse is at. And sometimes it also takes, it adds a little bit of objectivity to you because obviously even me, when I go out and I see one of my own horses colicking, despite all my training, sometimes it makes me flood with a little bit of panic. And so, and many times, I would say probably almost 80% of colics that I get called on don't actually ever have to come see me. But oftentimes I can talk you through or one of my staff can talk you through things to look for, things to do, um, and allow that horse to see where, see where we're at. Um, so don't hesitate to call. None of us are going to be bothered by you calling and asking questions. Uh, the second one is super, super important. Um, remove food from the horse. Um, the biggest problem that we have is that we want to know whether they, they want to eat. So oftentimes people will leave food in front of them. If a horse has, say, an impaction and is painful, they won't eat. 
but then all of a sudden maybe the GI tract is able to move that impaction a little bit further, which will release a little bit of pain. Well, consequently, sometimes those horses will eat again. And so they start kind of stuffing food into themselves and then they get painful again. So the best thing you can do is take away their food until your veterinarian tells you otherwise. Um, number one thing, especially in our colder climate that I do, um, I worry about impaction colics a lot. So I make people take away their food, leave some water and usually leave it in a bucket so that you can um, kind of uh, qualify how much water they actually do drink. <clears throat> Keep your horse in an area that it can be watched um, usually for 24 hours, even in a normal, like really easy, my horse got one dose of banamine colic, um, keep them somewhere they can be watched because I have a lot of horses that look good, say by seven o'clock in the morning, but by nine o'clock that night, they're acting colicky again. So keep some place where you can watch them carefully. Um, <clears throat> allow this my big thing is is i have had some people call me and say hey i've been walking my horse for four hours well unfortunately the only thing that has been accomplished by that is now the horse is tired and maybe he was dehydrated and now he's really dehydrated because he's walked for forever the only time i tell you to walk um, is if they are trying to go down and you are trying to get a horse trailer to come get them. Um, because sometimes overzealously walking horses can cause them to get dehydrated, to get weaker. Um, if you have to walk your horse to keep them comfortable, that's when they, they need to be seen or they need to come to your veterinarian. If a horse wants to stand there, or even if they just want to lay down and not roll, I allow them to do so. I just watch them super closely in case I have to get them up. Um, There's certain treatments once they get to a veterinarian. Um, uh, for example, like with right dorsal displacements, which is a type of um, colic where the colon moves. I actually give them IV fluids and then I have my staff take them for a 10 minute walk and then I'll give them more IV fluids. But walking should always be dictated by your veterinarian how much and when it should be done. So um, like I said, if, you, if your horse is needing to be walked because he, he is trying to roll or something like that, that is something you definitely wanna call on and not wait. Well, thank um, you for that note, because I think that is a common misconception. But if you can imagine yourself in pain, especially in gut pain, um, I think it would almost make it worse if, yep. you know, if they had to walk. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Dr. Marsh. Yeah, you're exactly right. And if their pain level is such that, um, that the only way you keep them up is by walking. Um, yeah, like they, they, there's something bigger going on and, and you're not gonna be able to solve that at home. And I do, I mean, and I think it, it really is an old, old, old wives tale, you know, walk your horse and it, it will get better. Walking is realistically just a way to keep them occupied while you're going for a solution. So, yeah. Okay. Um, these, these are things that you guys, especially when you call into your veterinarian, um, these are things to relay, um, the things that you're seeing, um, your signs that you're seeing, because each of those signs mean a little bit different to me. Um, not that you have to keep those straight in your head, but you just need to tell me everything that you see. Um, pulse or heart rate, respiratory rate is pretty important. Um, rectal temperature, like we talked about. Um, if these horses are really painful though, I will tell you that is the last thing I'm gonna tell you to do because I don't want you to get hurt. Oftentimes these horses will, will phantomly kick out because they're painful. I'd just rather you not, um, unless they're just kind of standing there and um, a little bit depressed. 
um, gum color. Gum color is huge. Um, we want, and the, the term is actually rose pink. And as you can think of a pink rose that's kind of palish pink, that is the color gum tissue should be in horses. And, um, and then moistness of their gums, you should be able to put your finger in there and pull it out and your whole finger should be moist, but it should not be dripping wet and it should not stick to their gums, which would mean it would be too dry. So that's kind of the things that, those are six really good things to have in the back of your head when you call your veterinarian. Um, here, so up in the upper left hand corner, that um, picture of the horse's gums, that don't look at necessarily the red dots that are there, but that lower pink color that is realistically rose pink is what you're looking for. The lower left hand corner, which is kind of a, what we call murky red, um, kind of almost brownish color, um, that very much means that we have some problems with our vascular flow. So if you see something like that, that is an immediate, you need to call your veterinarian. Um, capillary refill time, basically it is where you push your thumb into the gums and you push it in momentarily, let up, and you count how many time, how many seconds it takes for that color to return to normal. Um, normal in a horse is one to two seconds, um, which is kind of contrary to dogs. Dogs tend to be two to three seconds. So anybody that has a dog versus a horse, um, one to two seconds means that we have normal vascular flow and, um, and that things are going to refill. If it's very delayed, that's usually dehydration. If it is very fast um, or bright red, basically what you're looking at is a horse that's either in severe pain or has a lot of inflammation rolling around in their system. I had never um, heard of their gums being darker. That's interesting. And also you talked about your finger, you know, if, it, if it's dry, that makes sense because they're dehydrated, but what does it mean if they are- um, Excessively if, moist. Yes. Yeah, excessively moist. Um, sometimes what it can mean is certain situations, especially like stomach ulcers or um, something that's affecting the stomach, a colic that's affecting the stomach, the stomach has a lot of acid in it. And the way that the body combats that acid is we produce saliva and saliva is very high in bicarb and other buffers. So that's the body's own way of buffering the stomach is by increasing salivation. And you can imagine it as like when we are hungry and we want to eat food, we know the body knows that it's going to have to produce more saliva to help your stomach care, stomach very carefully digest your food. Well, in horses, if they have a very bad stomach ulcer or a gastric impaction, which is where the stomach is obstructed, they will actually produce a lot of saliva. Um, and so that can mean that there's more problems farther forward than maybe the, the hind gut of the horse. So, okay. So yeah. you can actually, it, it might actually help you locate the problem. That's interesting. Yep. yep absolutely. Um, digestive sounds, we kind of talked about bowel movements, absolutely consistency of bowel movements. You know, does my horse have diarrhea? Is it very dry? Um, how much of it? Um, mares very much have these usually large, big bowel movements, um, which is just kind of an anecdotal thing, but it is very true. And if you have a mare that's just is colicky and is only pooping out one or two little fecal balls at a time, that is very significant. So the, the quality of the stool, but also the number and the size of the bowel movements are very important. Um, actually, there was a question, if you don't mind me bringing it up, yeah. a couple of questions. Uh, one was, have you seen a colic episode with the horse still passing normal manure or passing diarrhea? Absolutely. Absolutely. They, um, many, many scenarios. So colic 
like a inflamed colon um, can produce diarrhea, but also a colon that is twisted and has a lot of infl inflammation, any of the stools that was behind the inflammation or behind the twist will actually still come out and oftentimes be extremely watery. And so diarrhea doesn't necessarily mean that there's not anything in the wrong place in a horse. It just means that there's inflammation and that the body's not dealing with it. Um, many horses will still, because I will have them come in and well, hey, they pooped in the trailer, so he must be fine. Not necessarily. If, if, if there is stool behind where the problem is, it can still come out sometimes. And um, so yes, very much just because you have the presence of stools doesn't mean that they're normal anymore. And uh, if there is mucus in the stool, uh, I, I forget what that, I knew what that was about, but can you yeah. talk a yeah, little bit? Yeah, mucus, yeah, absolutely. Mucus in the stool means that the stool has sat in one place for an abnormally long period of time. So, um, basically the body produces mucus trying to make that part move out um, kind of as a like a natural lubricant to get it to move and mucus usually means that there is impaction or dehydration going on okay okay thank you very yeah. much yeah absolutely um the last one on here recent diet recent changes um diet being the probably the most important the other is coming from uh travel history you know if i have a horse that comes to wyoming where we don't have a ton of sand colic but he comes from arizona or california where they have a lot of sand colic uh those are things i need to know i need to know where these horses have been um it can also tell me you know maybe we have some dehydration going on because they just moved here from someplace else um occasionally exercise can do it especially exercise in overly hot or overly cold um good examples of colic in hot are the summer olympics i mean veterinarians make their but you know, definitely do their due diligence at the Summer Olympics. There's a lot of horses that colic during those periods of time because oftentimes they're in very hot places and they're in a place that they've never been before. So um, that's that. They In my neck of the woods, um, uh, fall during hunting season, colic horses from outfitters and hunters come in because it's cold and they dehydrated and they've been working really, really hard. So just those history things can tell me very quickly what very well might be going on with that horse. Okay, um, I haven't had this happen very much. Um, I think it happened a little bit more um, earlier on. Um, please don't pass any kind of tube into your horse's stomach. Um, many of you probably know, but horses, the only way I can reach a horse's stomach is through their nose. Um, so nothing actually pushed into their mouth as, a, as in a tube is going to make it to their stomach. Um, don't, you know, don't syringe them mineral oil um, because oftentimes all they do is aspirate it because their stomach is maybe so tense that it, they're not swallowing well. Um, unless your veterinarian tells you don't give them anything by mouth. Um, let's see, um, inserting things into horses' rectums. I don't think that we see that as much anymore um, because generally a lot of our horse clients are fa fairly knowledgeable, but people used to try to do enemas. Um, unfortunately, enemas don't do anything in horses. Um, and the last one is, is giving intravenous injections. Um, unless and I mean, and these situations are very few and far between. Yes, do I have clients that I either know or have taught or something to give intravenous injections? Um, unless you really, really, really feel confident that you know what you're doing, um, please avoid it. Because oftentimes if something goes bad, 
um, that vein is no longer good to me as a veterinarian in order to place a catheter or to give other medications. And plus you just run, a, you, you run a high risk of something bad happening. So for your, for your own sanity, um, unless there's a different situation where you've been taught, um, just, you know, avoid it at all costs. <laughs> I actually have a question about, um, somebody said they've heard of giving Pepto-Bismol if the vet mm -hmm. is further away to help. Is this an old wives tale? Um, Pepto-Bismol. Um, you can, but probably it doesn't do anything. Um, the only caveat to that is foals. Um, foals are, they have a smaller gastrointestinal tract um, and it will help coat their stomachs and coat their um, early small intestines. The, the sheer amount of Pepto-Bismol that you would probably have to give a horse in order to coat their stomach would be profound. And so I don't think that you'd even really have any benefit of trying to get it in. Um, <clears throat> like I said, it would probably make you feel better than it actually does for the horse, unfortunately. Well, sometimes that's what you need. <laughs> well, amen. <laughs> we will we will all try about anything. So, um, yeah. So, I just um, had a quick uh, question about yeah. uh, banamine. Is that uh, intravenous injection or intramuscular? Okay. Yeah. This is the the age old question. Um, so, bottles of banamine are labeled um, mostly because of cattle. They are labeled for intermuscular and intravenous use. And um, in horses, what we know is that giving banamine in the muscle in certain situations can cause a horse to abscess in their neck. Of, in their neck. Um, that probably is secondary to um, not banamine itself, but maybe a dirty needle or skin bacteria, all of those things. And banamine probably due to pH and some other parts about the drug itself enhances the risk if given in the muscle. Um, I, what I tell people for banamine is I, you can use the injectable and you can squirt it in their mouth. Um, I do have a certain amount of clients that either um, outfitter horses or horses that are very far away and their only hope of getting that horse to me is by poking them in the neck with banamine. If that is the horse's last hope, then, then by all means do it and we'll fix the abscess later. <laughs> um, but if you are within two to three hours of your veterinarian, I would say never put it in the neck. Um, it just, you know, it, it would be more ideal if you could get your horse to the vet and they could give it intravenously. Um, that's probably the most important thing. Thank you so um, much. That's very interesting about the, that you could actually give injectable in their mouth. Uh, yes. No idea. It, it does work pretty darn good. The biggest caveat to horses that are colicking and if they're very mild, banamine by mouth, either the paste or the liquid is going to solve many, many horses issues. If you have a severe enough colic and you give it by their mouth, it's not going to do anything. And the reason that is, is their gastrointestinal tract is kind of shut down. It's not functioning. So that's the biggest reason why banamine doesn't work in some horses when given orally is that their colic is just literally too severe that their body's not absorbing it. And so that's when they will need something to be given intravenously to actually start to intervene. So <clears throat> biggest, biggest thing is, is realistically one dose of banamine orally, you're not going to do any harm. And so you talk to your veterinarian, they say, go ahead, let's give them a thousand pound dose of banamine and you give it. If they improve, great. If they don't within about 30 minutes, then, then we've got more significant issues. Well, thank so. you very much for that sidetrack. Uh, well, we appreciate it. <laughs> no, it's, it's probably the most important. It's the most important drug 
that people that horse owners can have all the time. And, and unfortunately, so many people call me and the first question my technicians are trained to ask is, do you have banamine? I will tell you almost seven to 10, seven out of 10 people will say, no, I don't. And then in my mind, I'm thinking of who that I know is close enough to them that might have banamine. So absolutely go out and in your saddlebags, in your trailer, in your tack room, have banamine stashed um, so that it is always available to you if you need it. But I think that you um, put together a little. Let's kit. see. This is this is kind of. Oh, absolutely, right. <laughs> absolutely. The biggest, the best thing you can. The, the best thing you can do is have a, you know, a stethoscope and a tube of banamine um, and a thermometer sitting in a little bag somewhere that is always accessible to you no matter where you go. So brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is kind of what I do when I see these horses. Obviously, I'm going to, I'm going to look over the entire horse. I'm going to palpate the horse rectally feel where everything is, feel if I feel gas, feel if I feel an impaction. And then the passage of a nasogastric tube, that is going to be plus or minus depending on the situation. If I palpate them and I feel something that says it doesn't matter whether I pass a tube or not, um, I'm, I may not necessarily pass it. Um, some veterinarians always do. It's kind of, each of us have a series of things we go through to diagnose these guys. Um, so for me, I will say probably eight out of 10 get a tube, um, but there are a few that don't. Um, belly taps, um, if we have a concern that there's something really bad going on in there, especially discerning whether they need to go to surgery, some of us will actually either use an ultrasound um, or just a little, um, what we call a teat cannula needle and pop in in the very bottom of their belly and collect the fluid. It can tell us if there's a lot of inflammation or intestinal disease or intestinal death. Um, many surgeons will do this before they take your horse to surgery because sometimes it can tell them whether they're gonna be successful in surgery or not. Um, blood tests, many of my colleagues always get um, a complete blood count, a chemistry, and then what we call an SAA, which is a um, inflammatory protein early indicator. Um, those things are going to either tell me like, you know, if they're dehydrated, how I can correct it, but also helps me when I call the surgeon to send that horse for surgery it gives them a good idea of where that horse is at before they even reach there. And sometimes can tell me if surgery is even an option or not. Um, finally, ultrasound, I use my ultrasound a ton. Um, we do what we call a fast scan, which is basically where I look in all four quadrants um, to see if things are where they need to be. Um, so um, <clears throat> very, very common for me to have the ultrasound now and just very quickly go through the horse. And all of this colic workup, probably from start to finish, probably takes about four minutes. Um, that's my hope anyways. Um, so expect that all of these things probably get done on your horse very fast and you might feel overwhelmed as an owner, but I promise you, we usually come back around and then give you the whole picture so that we can decide what to do with your horse at that point in time. And what are the blood tests deciding? They, what they're looking for is I mean, the big, big things is um, inflammation. So an increase in white blood cell count, um, dehydration, any kind of big um, gas colics will oftentimes push pressure on the liver. So increased liver enzymes actually can indicate that there's a lot of gas being produced within the system. Um, a low white blood cell count can be because we have a colitis or because we actually have something that's been going on long enough that the body has been fighting it. And sometimes that can actually tell me that there's a worsening prognosis for what's going on. So um, blood is extremely, extremely important. 
Okay. We'll go through these pretty quickly, mostly just so you guys have some names when people, when veterinarians talk to you. Um, colic, intestinal dysfunction, the biggest is going to be impaction, but also any kind of displacement where the colon itself is in the wrong position. Um, all of these oftentimes just displacement by itself, many times these things respond really well to medical therapy um, instead of surgery. Um, we call these intestinal accidents or basically what, what many people say are twists. And that's where the actual intestinal tract gets in the wrong position and then it flips on itself just like you were wringing out a rag. These, these are the ones that the horses get extremely painful and many of them in order to fix them require surgery um, and prognosis at some points can be very poor if not intervened on very early. Um, inflammation or ulceration, I see a ton of these, um, especially this time of year. Um, basically what we call enteritis or colitis. And that is basically an inflamed colon, whether it's because of diet change or um, because of excess, maybe excess butte use or um, antibiotic use. All of these things can cause inflammation of the colon. These cases oftentimes require the longest hospitalization. Um, my longest colitis that I had hospitalized was for 24 days. And they, they are by far um, can be the most expensive to fix um, um, in, if they stay in hospital for a long time. So that kind of, yeah, this leads into colitis. Like I said, this is one of the most common things I see. Um, probably for a long period of time was overlooked. Many people probably lost these horses because they were just really off for a long period of time. Um, these are some of the causes of colitis um, can be bacterial, um, salmonella. Salmonella colitis will kill horses within 24 to 48 hours. So diarrhea that is profuse diarrhea. Um, PHF stands for Potomac horse fever. So in certain areas of the country, um, Potomac horse fever is very big. We see Potomac horse fever over kind of on the eastern part um, of our area. Um, so I'll have like one or two cases a year. Um, Non-infectious sand, um, NSAIDs, butte use, um, daily butte um, can cause colitis. Um, antibiotics, uh, very um, long-term use of, of Uniprem or um, other sulfa drugs or Batril, those things can lead to antibiotic um, colitis. And then plants, uh, the blister beetle um, is one of the things, blister beetle toxin that is in alfalfa can cause colitis. And then in older horses, cancer is always a possibility. Um, Symptoms are extremely nonspecific. The biggest thing is my horse doesn't feel very good. He just doesn't eat very well. That is the biggest thing that pushes me in the direction of colitis. Um, some of them will have diarrhea and some of them will not. Um, the, big, the big sequela, the things that happen if colitis goes untreated can be laminitis and also this ventral edema where they get that spongy uh, swelling on their belly. That can mean that colitis has been going on for a long period of time. A spongy um, treatment. swelling on their belly. Wait, yeah, I and I don't know. So, feel that. Some people have, yeah, some people see it and some people don't. Um, but what it is, is it almost looks like you see a horse's belly and then below it is almost like another shelf that doesn't look like it should be there. And oftentimes it's in front of the sheath or in front of the mammary glands. And when you push in on it, instead of being firm, you will actually be able to see your fingerprint. And, and that, that, that is, is it a small, like a pocket? I've seen that sort of swelling on a pregnant mare that didn't get enough movement yes. it, that that is exactly what that is and what it is is it's just vascular 
compromise. So mares will get it, especially late term mares that don't move around very well. They'll get that little plaque of edema there. But horses that have colitis, the reason why they get it is their proteins in their blood are all messed up. So, oh, wow. um, so they will actually leak fluid into those areas. Um, that when I see that, that means disease has been going on for a while. And how big is that? Uh, that edema is it? Is yeah. it just a very small circle ahead of the kind of around the belly button area, or can it? Is it uh, all around? It, it can definitely range. Um, probably by the time we see it, it's usually about the size of a dinner plate. The longer it's been going on, it'll actually can stretch all the way up to between their front legs. Oh, wow. And it, so, it and those associated the, with swelling of the sheath or the mammary glands as well. Yep, it absolutely sure. can. Yep, it can, and it can be associated with a number of things. It basically tells me that something is going on um, that's messing with their vascular flow. And especially in a horse that I have that's got diarrhea or has been not off feed, I do start looking more at their intestinal tract than other things. Well, thank you for that uh, sidetrack because I hadn't heard of that ventral edema. Yeah. Um, yeah. And by the way, I'm just getting some great comments. People are really enjoying what you're saying. So thank you for all the information. Oh, absolutely. No. Oh. Um, yeah. So colitis treatment, treatment in these guys is supportive. It is IV fluid therapy. It's stomach protectants. It's ulcer guard. In some cases, it's antibiotics. That's kind of dependent on which situation, like Potomac horse fever, we treat with oxytetracycline, which is an antibiotic. But obviously if antibiotics caused it in the first place, you're not gonna treat them with antibiotics. Um, the biggest kicker that I always let my clients know when they first come in is these cases are roller coasters and they can be extremely expensive. Some of these cases are more expensive than colic surgery itself. So be prepared if your horse gets colitis that some days they may be better, the next day they may be worse, um, that your veterinarian will have to very dynamically evaluate them probably about every six hours to really see where they're at. So obviously these horses are always, or almost always hospitalized and usually hospitalized for a number of days. Um, very rarely, if I have a colitis, do they go home earlier than three days. So expect them to be there. And the biggest kicker is, is don't, especially if you want prognosis to be very good for your horse, don't stop therapy too soon. Um, I've had a few people that, you know, were concerned about the length that their horses were hospitalized. So they've taken them home. And what happens is sometimes those horses get sick again. And then when they get sick again, oftentimes their prognosis is much poorer. So I always ask people, please, please let me keep them until I feel like they're very stable. So I think that is most important. Um, treatment, obviously, pain relievers, banamine um, sedatives we use to keep these horses from rolling, um, fluid therapy, um, IV, this is an IV set that's attached to this horse. Obviously, if you've had a horse that's had IV fluids, you will understand, but hooking IV fluids to horses, um, we it can be very hard to keep fluids running to these guys. Um, and so it is, is a process um, for sure. Um, nasal gastric tubes, oh, sorry, get back. Um, many of us, especially for impactions, will tube them with electrolytes, sometimes mineral oil, um, things to help loosen up impactions. Um, obviously sedation to keep them comfortable so that they don't roll. Um, and then surgery in certain circumstances. Um, my biggest thing for surgery is I always warn or tell people, don't feel bad if surgery is not an option. Surgery is a big undertaking. And do not ever feel that you're gonna get your veterinarian, like have them be judgmental because you decide that surgery is 
not an option for your horse. That is an okay decision. And I have six horses personally. I have three horses that I would do surgery on and I have three horses that I wouldn't for numerous reasons, age, um, value. I mean, these are all part of having horses that we all understand that there are going to be some of them that we just can't justify surgery. So, so don't ever feel judged if you are presented with that option and you have to say, you know, no, I can't do that. That is, that is an okay option. It's, it's horses go undergoing surgery is a big, big thing. Um, Oh, this was my next question. It is the question. Yeah, yes, <laughs> it's <yes>. perfect. <laughs> is it worth it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably when I was in veterinary school, I performed probably close to 300 colic surgeries, um, which is why I really, really enjoyed doing it. it I, um, but um, it, there, there is a big gamut of whether it's worth it. Um, I think this is a question that every horse owner should know about each one of their horses before their horse even colics. Um, especially if you live in an area where a surgeon is farther away. Um, the surgeon that I choose to use is about two hours away. Um, I choose to use him because I think that he is the best in our area and that his prognosis is very good. And so, um, but that being said, it is is about the third question that I ask owners when they walk through the door is, is your horse a surgical candidate? And the reason is, is because I have to know very quickly whether the signs that I'm seeing, if I have a two hour window, do are they severe enough that he needs to go now? Do I have time to try to medically intervene? Is this horse worth a lot of money? And, and in reality, I mean, that is a, that is a part of the horse industry is, you know, some of these horses um, and some of them are dictated by insurance. Some of these horses are insured and the only way their insurance is going to become relevant is if that horse is taken to colic surgery. So look at each one of your horses, know whether you are willing to spend, spend $10,000 on that horse tomorrow. And if you are, then absolutely tell your veterinarian, this is where I'm at with my horse. Um, it, it will differ horse to horse. Um, cost for colic surgery, like I said, anywhere between $1,500 and $10,000. Um, and aftercare surgery itself is actually many times in these horses very good. It's the aftercare that can be very expensive. Um, incisional infections. Um, sometimes horses have a very long time before they'll eat again very consistently. So oftentimes there's some of these horses that are hospitalized anywhere from two to 10 days afterwards. So I think you really, really have to have that discussion with yourself and, and with whoever you own the horse with that, that whether this is going to be an expense that you're willing to undertake. Um, survival rate, honestly, is actually pretty darn good. Depending on the reason, um, the statistics are about 85% will get through surgery and about 75% will be discharged. Um, return, return to performance, that study was done in racehorses, which you can see is actually pretty good. 83% of them will, um, in racehorses, will, will start another race, which is pretty darn good because we, we classify thoroughbred racing as the, the epitome of athletic performance. Um, so many of them do. Many of them do start again, and some of them actually go and do better than they did before. Four. So, so um, very well, um, the biggest thing is that next to last thing is time matters. Um, I am I am very happy to get these guys out the door into a surgical facility, even if even if that horse maybe doesn't need surgery but has a surgical option. If I can send him to my referral surgeon and that referral surgeon just puts him on IV fluids, that's great. But if he needs surgery, he's standing there in the facility ready to go. So there's sometimes and probably 
close to five out of 10 that I send to a surgeon that they won't end up having surgery, but they're there if they need it. And um, so time is, is always of the essence in these cases. And so if your veterinarian brings it up, they probably seriously need to know the answer to that question. Um, I appreciate you talking about the um, the survival rates, but if they was if this study was done on racehorses, I was thinking mm -hmm. that this was probably done on a group of younger horses. I'm wondering yeah. if you um, if there is a, a certain age where you say that you know the surgery may not be as um, successful, or also yeah. that it might be you know difficult for your horse to recover or just undergo the surgery? Yeah, no, and that is absolutely a great question. It, um, I think that with any horse as they age, your immune system is not quite as good. Um, your ability to heal, your athletic ability, all those things do go down with age. What I will say just as like a, uh, as a, a clinical case to look at, um, I had a 16 year old cutting horse, um, kind of an old warrior, high, medium to high level cutting horse, but he's 16 years old. Um, he was actually at my facility being treated for a lameness and had been hospital, like hospitalized to be treated for lameness. And um, he had been a horse that had had ulcers as a young horse and I would chronically managed him here now for probably almost 10 years doing very well but probably stress or something kicked him over the edge um he got super painful on me one evening um I referred him and he had an intestinal twist um, um basically his his right dorsal colon was in on the other side of him um I put him on IV fluids. I hung IV fluids in the trailer and they zipped up to the surgeon. And that horse did have some incisional infection issues. Um, but we are probably, probably 16 weeks out, almost four months. And that horse just won a $1,200 check at the local cutting. So it, it, he, again, and he's six, like, again, 16 years old. Um, I think you have to take those guys case by case. Um, but I've known some probably middle to older horses that have done very well with surgery. Um, the biggest kicker when they get really old, probably above 20, is there's a high chance that your surgeon's going to go in there and find cancer. And obviously, that is a whole different ballgame. So, Yes, I think your survival rates probably go down with age, but probably not significantly until you reach that 20 to 22 years of age. And what about the significant, the, the amount of reoccurrence? I've always been under the impression that great if your horse undergoes surgery and they come through, they can return to performance, but uh, I'm sure it depends on what happens inside if they have to remove a, a section of the gut or if they're just untwisting it um, Absolutely. is there a higher chance of reoccurrence of colic after surgery you know I don't you know and this is where I can't quite quote any kind of studies and I'm sure there are some um, what I will tell you clinically I've probably sent in my 10 years of practice I've probably sent maybe 200 to surgery and probably kept track of about 50 of them. Um, I only know three horses that recurred and had to go to surgery a second time or were put down. Um, the caveat to that, many, many of your horses that are performance horses or even pleasure horses that go and have surgery, most of those horses do very well and many of them don't recur, especially if if we manage them a little differently. Um, the caveat to that is mares who have colic surgeries after having foals, um, which is actually a fairly common thing. Those mares are at a higher incident of having surgery or having a severe enough colic incident again. And um, 
that is the one scenario when I have a mare that has just had a baby. So they have a lot of room in their belly and many of those mares will actually flip their colons. Um, there are a few of those horses that once they get back from surgery, um, they do really well for a while and then things happen again. Um, so I am very careful in those incidents. Your average horse, probably recurrence is lower than what we would expect it to be. So, yeah. And uh, just so you know, Dr. Marsh, it's 712 right now. So we have <laughs> about 15 minutes left. Uh, there's a few questions, but I'm sure you have a few more slides to get through. So we'd love to see that. Yeah, I'll skip the, through these pretty quickly. I want to put a plug for these two programs. Um, both of these programs, um, one is by Smart Pack, the other one's by Platinum. Um, I have had both of these programs pay out extremely well on colic surgery. Um, and especially for the low amount of money, I mean, both of those products are very expensive, but um, I have probably 10 plus horses that these guys have paid out and actually haven't really been hard to deal with um, at all. And so something to consider, especially if you already feed either of these guys' um, programs, um, it's not, I don't even think that either of them charge you anything to become part of the program. I may be very wrong with that, um, but um, is something to consider. Um, um, I've had really good experiences with both companies. Um, the other thing is insurance. Um, if your horse, um, you know, I have insurance, like I said, on three horses. Um, many insurance companies are actually pretty darn good at working with you um, and have pretty good colic payouts um, for surgery and for mortality. So I think it's something to consider. Um, your insurance companies will somewhat dictate your treatment plans, so you have to be prepared for that. Um, but I have quite a few clients that that do do insurance on some of their um, their more um, expensive horses, and I do think that they are worth it um, for those horses. Um, uh, I have uh, had experience with the Platinum program, and I think SmartPack is the same. They don't charge you anything. You just have to enroll in the program and be on their auto ship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the A few of these slides, I mean, I think if you want me to, I'm absolutely happy to post this presentation somewhere so that you guys can look through them. Um, stomach ulcers are huge, um, probably a whole nother hour and a half on their own. Um, um, maybe something that we could talk about in the future or something. But the biggest caveat and thing to take home with is up to 60 to 90% of your performance horses. Um, and this includes just even your ranch horse or your trail horse are going to have stomach ulcers. So keep that in the back of your mind um, when you're developing your feeding programs and let your veterinarian maybe be a part of that a little bit so that they can prevent stomach ulcers because they can become a problem in the future. Um, this talks about symptoms. Like I said, I'm happy to post this presentation. Um, um, and a lot of these are preventative stuff, um, which I do think is super important. The biggest thing about horses is horses are a creature of habit. So recognize that anytime that you change a program on a horse, that you do increase your odds of having colic. So do things very gradual um, and don't, you know, overdo things very quickly. Horses just aren't designed to do that very well. Um, fresh, clean water, especially in the wintertime, make sure your water's warm, um, or at least lukewarm. Make sure that your water heaters aren't shocking horses. Um, that happens more frequently than you'd like to know. Um, and then watch where you're feeding your horses. Make sure that you're not feeding them out of a really sandy lot, um, or gravel, things that they can, um, ingest and accumulate. Just, just so you know, Dr. Marsh, it's pretty adorable. Everyone is freaking out about your um, 
presentation on ulcers. They've made many requests for additional presentations. <laughs> and you've even been offered an audiobook uh, contract. So just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, I, um, for real, I'm pretty sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But no, that that's most of my presentation. Um, like I did in my other presentation, I, this is my shameless plug. We um, at Prairie Summit, we did a, a calendar for um, for charity um, for a organization called Wild Hoof Beats. This actually helps at risk teens um, do um, some wonderful things with some hippotherapy. So we made a calendar that's all of our clients' dogs. Um, or dogs and horses. And so if any of you guys want anything you, or want one, um, we're happy to ship them to you and you can um, just message us on Facebook. Um, it goes to a good cause and there's some really good pictures in there. So yeah, so that's my shameless plug. Um, so that's I'm good for any questions. <laughs> and you know, we'll talk to Lisa Rask and we'll get that put on our Facebook as well to make sure that people okay. have uh, this link. And there has been some really interesting questions throughout the presentation. And uh, please hold on because we are gonna give you that um, IHA Live code for you to get your discount on your IHA membership. Uh, maybe if you wanna turn off your screen share so we don't have too many things going on and you could turn your camera back, we can make that uh, an experiment if I can make here. this happen. <laughs> Uh, oh no i'll try to figure this out let's see okay Fine. okay um stop usually sharing. you can just hit yeah there you go there we go there and we go you can uh act, put just turn your camera back on that should work and so i've had uh some interesting questions come up I'm just going to scroll back because there was one at the very beginning that I uh, didn't get a chance to answer. All right, uh, Ralph Scott asks, Dr. Marsh, has there been any studies that have documented how wild horses address colic? As we know that dogs, for example, are known to eat grass when they are suffering from stomach issues. Um, is there any information about horses? You know, I'm, I'm bet that there probably is. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know of any particular. Um, what I will say is that I do know that that in that our incidence in colic in wild horses is probably is significantly less, um, and it's probably because their forage is is pretty straightforward, and they don't they very rarely change, so um yeah so that they, they are significantly less colic incidents in those horses oftentimes the reason horses colic are management issues we feed them twice a day versus letting them forage all day long that's why horses on pasture actually have a significantly lower incidence of colic so i'm sure there's studies out there people probably done quite a bit of research on that i've never read any per se um read a ton on what we do to our performance horses and how the reasons why they colic um but it is it is probably much lower incidence in them because it is a more i guess quote unquote natural way for their body to live mm -hmm. and uh, there's also a question about um donkeys or mules do they mm. colic any differently <laughs> um what i will say that i I don't know if there is any papers on them, but what I will say when they colic, it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, very, very rarely do I get a mule that comes in for, for colic. It's probably their pain tolerance. Um, so by the time they show you that something is bad, like that they are hurting, they usually have something very wrong with them. Um, I will say close to nine out of 10 that come in for a colic episode, oftentimes don't leave my facility. Oh, wow. um, and so, and we have, a, we have a high amount of mules and donkeys in our area oh. and um, they just don't colic very much. And when they do, it's, it's not very good. 
Well, that's interesting. And uh, yes, we do have a lot of packing mules around here. Mm -hmm. so, Susan asked a question, uh, is globulin part of a liver enzyme panel? Um, yes, in general, it is a part of my, what I call my equine profile, which I run on all, all of my colics or my sick courses. Um, globulin and albumin are part of the total proteins that we look at. Um, I put less stock in globulin sometimes, um, mostly because I have something called the SAA, which is serum amyloid A, and it is a what we call an acute phase protein. So it's a protein in the blood that will show elevations very early before things like globulin have a chance to respond. So I can actually find out much quicker from SAA that something's going on um, rather than waiting around for globulins to be increased, which makes the, means the immune system has to respond and all of that, so okay. Yeah. That's wonderful. Uh, Ada from Canada asked a question. She says, in the winter, I give my horses a lot of soaked hay cubes, mm -hmm. especially with the temperature swings around. Uh, I think that it keeps them more hydrated. Do you think that it makes any difference? I actually do. I have quite a few clients that actually do use soaked hay cubes. Um, some people around here will actually soak hay cubes and put a little bit of um, table salt over them. Mm -hmm. um, we know actually from less in horses and more in actually cats, we know that ingesting moisture in addition to feed when combined together, horses hydrate or animals hydrate better. Um, it's kind of like us, like I don't like to drink water out of a water bottle, but I will drink and eat soup all day long and sure with our food and works better that way. So um, soaked bee pulp, a lot of people, especially in the Eastern side of the United States will do soaked bee pulp to get more moisture in. Um, some people will do soak senior. When I have horses post colic surgery to get moisture into them, I will do um, soak senior, kind of a senior mash per se. Um, so absolutely, I think that really does encourage hydration. It's probably more that it, it's not that that takes like that fixes their hydration. It's more that it stimulates them to drink better. Okay. And what about uh, any supplements you would recommend for chronic colicky horses? Um, I, you know, using my traditional Chinese medicine, I, I do use a lot of herbs um, for chronic colicky horses. The other thing, I, I mean, I, I don't do a lot of support are both really good formulas that have probiotics, um, different parts of them that are help heal up the um, intestinal mucosa, um, because that's the biggest thing is, is damage to the intestinal mucosa always affects how well that gut functions. Um, so those two, I use a ton. There are, there are a million on the market. Um, Can you restate that? Because I think you froze up just a little when you, when you said that oh, those two things. Oh, um, uh, platinum and um, platinum has a gastric support and they also have one, I think that's called intestinal support. Um, both of those are really good, depending on where your horse has had issues. Um, gastric support is really good for those performance horses that have had stomach ulcers. Um, the intestinal support, um, many horses are on that after colic surgery for quite some time and sometimes for a lifetime. Um, so I think both of those formulas are great. The biggest thing you're looking for is probiotics, um, um, what we call emollients or things that help soak up bad bacteria and bacteria byproducts. When you're looking at your supplements, that's kind of what you're looking for. But like I said, there's a million on the market. And I think you just have to do your research to know that there's some decent um, investigation into them. So. What about homeopathic? Um, I know that you're very much into your Chinese herbs, marshmallow root. 
I think was one of the things that you mentioned to me. Was that uh, for the gastric support? Yes. Yes, I think um, that um, aloe is big in horses with, with gastric issues. Um, I'm trying to think of some more. A lot of mine are just general big because um, uh, Chinese medicine works in the, like a balance of multiple um, herbs. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of, I use a lot of aloe. I have a lot of barrel racing clients um, for whatever reason. And aloe seems to keep a lot of those horses at least controlled. I will say it's not a treatment, keep them controlled. Um, so I do end up using a lot of aloe. So, so just an aloe juice that you can get from, I mean, I even get mine from Walmart. Mm -hmm. And I yep. added that to my pony that was having some gastric issues. Um, and it did seem to help quite a bit. Yeah. It's much less expensive than starting with the ulcer medications if it's possible. Um, Absolutely. I also read about uh, chia seeds as part of, uh, have you heard of that as well? Yes, and I think that there's a couple of companies, I even think Platinum looked at it at one point in time, um, a couple of the other, um, I'm trying to think of the other company I'm thinking, that started incorporating them in, and whether it was because of fiber, but in humans, chia seeds are really supposed to help with acid production. So I don't know if that's some of the thought process, um, but many human nutritionists will tell you that eating like a bagel with peanut butter and chia seeds on it will actually decrease stomach acid early in the morning. So, well, and what I read was that, you know, those seeds, when you soak them, they expand and form a gel around the outside. So mm -hmm. maybe it helps. Um, one other uh, question would be feeding your horse psyllium. Is there yeah. too much psyllium? You know, is it is it bad to have a horse on a, a you know, a supplement that's consistent with psyllium or is that something that you should yeah. sprinkle in here and there? Here and there. I think the jury is a little out. Many of us veterinarians um, still kind of apply the older mantra of, especially if you're in a place that has a lot of sand, um, feeding um, psyllium or sand clear the first week of every month helps cleanse everything. I don't think they need to be on a, on a daily basis. Um, and if your horse is or has been, I think you have to be really careful to slowly back off of it because I think if you do it too quickly um, or if you increase it too quickly, um, you can get weird gas production issues because psyllium is a fiber and fiber is obviously digested by those bacteria that produce gas. So I think you have to be really I think you have to be really careful with it. When I do my sand clears on some of my horses, I will actually start at the lower end of the dose and sometimes not even go as high. Um, your California, um, Arizona veterinarians may feel differently because they see more sand issues, but I'm a little bit more conservative with psyllium than maybe they are. Well, that's, I appreciate you saying that maybe we shouldn't do it too quickly or come off of it too quickly. I've had that result with my horses. I've used it to, if they've had a bit of colitis or something, and then removed it and then suddenly it comes back. So yeah, uh, that's significant. Well, Dr. Marsh, um, you're getting many requests for additional lectures. Everyone is loving this. So I'll have to bug you about, I know you're a busy, busy lady. We so appreciate your time for this. And uh, uh, just a reminder for everyone who came, uh, we will be posting this IHA Live on the IHA website. So you will be able to see this along with uh, Dr. Marsh's other videos that she's done. We did a presentation on um, worming, deworming and vaccinations, and those are on our website. So now, now for the time uh, that you all have been waiting for, um, the IHA, and I'm just going to bring up my screen for a minute here, but the IHA is a nonprofit centered on relationship-based horsemanship. And we love to sponsor amazing, uh, knowledgeable horse people in all parts of the industry, like Dr. Marsh here. If you know of somebody that would uh, make a great guest for us, 
please let us know. We are always looking for more guests. But uh, if you are interested in supporting this amazing nonprofit that is trying to give more uh, information about how this is way more than training, how it is really about the when you really can communicate with your horse and develop a relationship, it goes so much further than training. So we're actually going to give you a special promotional code this evening. It is good for 24 hours. And the code is uh, LIVE20, all capitals. And we will be posting that in the chat. So please tell your friends. And that is for the digital membership. If you go into the join button, and then the digital membership is normally $49. And so that will reduce that to a $39 fee for the entire year. So please tell your friends about that. And uh, the IHA does put out a journal magazine. And I was going to beg Dr. Marsh if, uh, do you have a little article written up about um, kind of a summary of what you've talked about the colic at all? I sure can probably put one. Absolutely. Because <laughs> that would be great, especially the signs that people need to have in their back pocket when they call the vet. That would be so wonderful if you wouldn't mind between all the other things that you were doing. I apologize. I think my internet's <laughs> slacking. <laughs> it made it till the end. So that's that's all that matters. So again, that code was live. I know. <laughs> it was like this, right? That code was LIVE20. Dr. Marsh, thank you again for a fabulous presentation. Uh, I think you're going to have to come back if we can drag you back here. And thank you everyone for coming. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>